Hey everybody, back for chapter three of Holes. And uh, to start off, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, how the story changes its time frame a little bit. Um, so we have Stanley in the present at Camp Green Lake. We have Stanley in the past. We have um, Camp Green Lake in the past and kind of how that all ties together. Um, so I want you guys thinking about um, all the different timelines that run through the book and how important those are um, and how they are tied together. Okay, so chapter three. Stanley Yelnats was the only passenger on the bus, not counting the driver or the guard. The guard sat next to the driver with his seat turned around facing Stanley. A rifle lay across his lap. Stanley was sitting about 10 rows back, handcuffed to his armrest. His backpack lay on the seat next to him. It contained his toothbrush, toothpaste, and a box of stationery his mother had given him. He promised to write her at least once a week. He looked out the window, and although there wasn't much to see, it was mostly fields of hay and cotton. He was on a long bus ride to nowhere. The bus wasn't air conditioned, and the hot, heavy air was almost as stifling as the handcuffs. Stanley and his parents had tried to pretend that he was just going away to camp for a little while, just like rich kids do. When Stanley was younger, he used to play with stuffed animals and pretend his animals were at camp. Camp fun and games, he called it. Sometimes he'd have them play soccer with a marble. Other times they'd run an obstacle course or go bungee jumping off a table, tied to broken rubber bands. Now Stanley tried to pretend he was going to cut camp fun and games. Maybe he'd make some friends, he thought. At least he'd get to swim in the lake. He didn't have any friends at home. He was overweight and the kids at his middle school often teased him about his size. Even his teachers sometimes made cruel comments without realizing it. On the last day of school, his math teacher, Mrs. Bell, taught ratios. As an example, she chose the heaviest kid in the class and the lightest kid in the class and had them weigh themselves. Stanley weighed three times as much as the other boy. Mrs. Bell wrote the ratio on the board three to one, unaware of how much embarrassment she had caused both of them. Stanley was arrested later that day. He looked at the guard who sat slumped in his seat and wondered if he had fallen asleep. The guard was wearing sunglasses so Stanley couldn't see his eyes. Stanley wasn't a bad kid. He was innocent of the crime for which he was convicted. He'd just been in the wrong place at the wrong time. It was all because of his no good, dirty, rotten, pig stealing great, great grandfather. He smiled. It was a family joke. Whenever anything went wrong, they always blamed Stanley's no good, dirty, rotten, pig stealing great, great grandfather. Supposedly, he had a great, great grandfather who had stolen a pig from a one legged gypsy and she put a curse on him and all his descendants. Stanley and his parents didn't believe in curses, of course, but when anything ever went wrong, it felt good to be able to blame someone. Things went wrong a lot. They always seemed to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. He looked out the window at the vast emptiness. He watched the rise and fall of a telephone wire. And in his mind, he could fear his hear his father's gruff voice softly singing to him. If only, if only the woodpecker sighs, the bark on the tree was just a, bit, a little bit softer. While the, while the wolf waits below, hungry and lonely, he cries to the moon, if only, if only. It was a song his father used to sing to him. The melody was sweet and sad, but Stanley's favorite part was when his father would howl the word moon. The bus hit a small bump and the guard sat up instantly alert. Stanley's father was an inventor. To be a successful inventor, you need three things, intelligence, perseverance, and just a little bit of luck. Stanley's father was smart and had a lot of perseverance, but once he started a project, he would work on it for years, often going days without sleep. He just never had any luck. Every time an experiment failed, Stanley could hear him cursing his dirty, rotten, pig-stealing great-grandfather. Stanley's father was also named Stanley Yelnats. Stanley's father's full name was Stanley Yelnats III. Our Stanley is Stanley Yelnats IV. Everyone in his family had always liked the fact that Stanley Yelnats was spelled the same frontward and backward, so they kept naming their son Stanley. Stanley was an only child, as was every other Stanley Yelnats before him. All of them had something else in common. Despite their awful luck, they always remained hopeful. As Stanley's father liked to say, 
I learned from failure. But perhaps what was part of the curse as well. If Stanley and his father weren't always hopeful, then it wouldn't hurt so much every time their hopes were crushed. Not every Stanley Yelnats was a failure, Stanley's mother often pointed out. When Stanley or his father became so discouraged that they actually started to believe in the curse. The first Stanley Yelnats, Stanley's great-grandfather, had made a fortune in the stock market. He couldn't have been too unlucky. At such time, she neglected to mention the bad luck that befell the first Stanley Yelnats. He lost his entire fortune when he was moving from New York to California. His stagecoach was robbed by the outlaw Kissin' Kate Barlow. If it weren't for that, Stanley's family would now be living in a mansion on a beach in California. Instead, they were crammed in a tiny apartment that smelled of burning rubber and foot odor. If only, if only. The apartment smelled the way it did because Stanley's father was trying to invent a way to recycle old sneakers. The person who finds a use for old sneakers, he said, will be a very rich man. It was the latest project that Stanley le that led to Stanley's arrest. The bus ride became increasingly bumpy, bumpy because the road was no longer paved. Actually, Stanley, Stanley had been impressed when he first found out that his grand great-grandfather was robbed by kissing Kate Barlow. True, he would have preferred living on the beach in California, but it was still kind of cool to have someone in your family robbed by a famous outlaw. Kate Barlow didn't actually kiss Stanley's great grandfather. That would have been really cool, but she only kissed the men she killed. Instead, she robbed him and left him stranded in the middle of the desert. He was lucky to have survived, Stanley's mother was quick to point out. The bus was slowing down. The guard grunted as he stretched his arms. Welcome to Camp Green Lake, the driver said. Stanley looked out the dirty window. He couldn't see a lake and hardly anything was green. So what do you think? Do you think Stanley's going to be lucky or will he have the same awful luck as the rest of the Stanley Yelnats and his family? All right.